Dave Hicks, and today we're going to take a look at uh, analyzing some hydrocarbons through the lens of infrared spectroscopy. Uh, this is part of my series where we've been analyzing hydrocarbons and we've gone over several different analysis techniques that are used by chemists who, uh, you know, would take the clues from each one of these different uh, types of analyses and try to combine them together to figure out what is this molecule, how is it all put together, what is the shape of this molecule, and uh, we do it by using a little bit of chemistry and then a little bit of these uh, spectroscopies, these spectras that we've been talking about and uh, trying to come up with the shape or the structural formation of the hydrocarbon itself. So let's talk a little bit about infrared spectroscopy today. Um, the infrared spectroscopy uses a different section of the, uh, in the, of the uh, electromagnetic wave spectrum and uh, uses infrared waves. The infrared waves cause the specific bonds to kind of vibrate and uh, resonate with uh, that particular wave that's being sent in. Uh, the bonds vibrate in different ways, so different types of bonds vibrate differently, of course. And then uh, the individual bonds actually vibrate in more than one way. Here's an example of some of them, you know. Um, the uh, different vibrations, of course, are picked up as resonance frequencies. They resonate or, or a certain frequency will cause the bond to vibrate in this particular way. And then that's something that gets recorded electronically uh, by looking at the infrared that is being passed through this uh, substance and what uh, infrared uh, waves come out of the substance afterwards. Very similar to colorimetry that we use or uh, the uh, color spectroscopy that we use when we're using colors, except we're just using a different uh, area of the electromagnetic spectrum. But if we could see it, it would be very similar to the same type of, a, uh, of an appearance. All right, so here is what one of the spectras looks like. And uh, there's some things I would really like to point out here about this spectra as we take a look at it uh, for the first time here. Huh? So uh, I'm gonna grab me my pen so I just don't feel right as a teacher uh, poking around on things without being able to write on it for some reason. I've been like that for years and years, huh? Okay, so let's take a look at this spectra that we might see. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is down here with the, uh, uh, what are these axes, right? Anytime you're looking at a set of axes, a set of graphs or something, you need to pay attention to the axes and figure out what they are. Uh, so the wave number down here is really kind of corresponding to, uh, similarly to a frequency or a wavelength. Uh, I'm not going to go into explaining exactly what we mean by a wave number. Uh, that's outside of the scope of what we want to do today. But uh, you can think of this as kind of like a frequency. And specific bonds will take place at specific wave numbers. So here you can see a carbonyl group and uh, this this uh, peak or valley here, we're going to call it a peak in just a second, takes place right around this uh, 1750, 1800 mark on the wave number. Here you can see a hydroxyl group right here, and hydroxyl groups tend to take place greater than 3000. And so we're going to take a look at a couple of them, and you'll see that they're on that side of 3,000. So the wave number is one of the things we pay attention to, where it's located, and specific bonds will locate themselves at specific points in the uh, wave uh, number. The other thing I want to point out to you, and this is probably the most important thing because over the years I've caught students trying to read this upside down, huh? And uh, so when we look at this, this is a transmittance. 
So transmittance is when something is, uh, you know, how much of it is passing through. Now, we're talking about bonds that resonate, and when they resonate, they absorb the energy from the infrared waves. So um, transmittance, this would be 100% transmittance up here. That means all of it went through. Nothing interfered with the infrared wave that was passed through there. But when you get down here and you start getting to, you know, 10% transmittance, that means something is absorbing the infrared wave that is passing through there. It's sucking it up, if you will, and uh, not allowing it to pass through. So this graph is really kind of read upside down from the way that we read normal graphs. And in fact, we even kind of call things backwards from the way that it is uh, referred to in, in normal graphs. We call this right here, like see that? I, I'm, I'm reading this for what's going down, huh? I'm reading to see what's going down. And we call this a peak even though it's really more like a valley, isn't it? So when we refer to peaks, we're not referring to something way up here. This is not a peak to uh, an organic chemist reading an infrared spectrum. A peak is way down here. The graph is reading kind of in the opposite direction. See, starting up here and we're reading things that come down here. These are where the identifiers are. So this would be an important peak to me. This would be an important peak to me. We're going to talk about these little peaks over here that take place. But again, the peaks are not up on top. The peaks are down here on the bottom. Huh? So that's the way that we read these graphs. We're going to be taking a look at these peaks or valleys that uh, take place with the infrared. We're going to note what their wave numbers are. That's important. And another thing that we're going to note about this is that some of these have different shapes, don't they? And so some of the peaks are like really sharp. You can see these right here are really sharp. And some of them are really what we would call broad peaks like this, right? So uh, that also plays some consideration for us as well. Now, um, I'm taking this information from a dude's website, and uh, he did an awesome job of explaining this. I have a credit coming up for him a little bit later on, but I want to thank him for putting all of this together. I stumbled across it a couple of years ago, and it really has helped out my students uh, over the years, having them look at it for one, and uh, having me have a, a, a clear way of presenting this information that helps my students out. Okay, so when you're reading a spectra, here's uh, some things that you want to look for and something that you don't want to try and do, okay? One thing that you really don't want to try and do is you do not want to try and um, interpret every single peak that is in this spectra, okay? We're only going to look for very specific peaks that are in the spectra. And uh, I highlighted three of them that is, seems to me to be the very most useful ones for things that I do with my class and with the IB curriculum that I teach. And I think as a youngster taking uh, these this course and learning how to use this for real, I think these were some of the most helpful ones as well. So uh, taking a look at this then, uh, we're going to look for uh, carbonyl groups and you can see here he has a carbonyl stretch, he calls it, and look at it, it takes place at a specific area, it takes place between about 1650 and 1800 on the uh, wave number and so and it looks like this uh this person talked about tongues and swords huh now a sword is pointy yes 
a sharp edged skinny thing, maybe you might think. So I guess I'm not thinking of like a broad sword here. I'm thinking of a skinny kind of a sword. And then he talks about tongues and a tongue is like wider. So here's the OH over here. You can see it's a little greater than 3000 for a wave number. And you can see that it's very broad, isn't it? Kind of like a tongue here. And then this one is very skinny and, and it kind of looks like a sword, huh? So these are a couple of things. Um, notice he notes up here, and I'll bring this up later, that a uh, nitrogen-hydrogen stretch for amine groups will also take place kind of in this pink area between 33 and 3500. Usually a little bit further to the right than the OH stretch. Uh, when you put the two together, it really kind of turns into a really big wide region. But um, anyways, we'll, we'll try to talk about that. And we'll talk about something else special with the amine groups uh, a little later on as well. So right now, big thing, don't try to figure out every peak. Uh, look for these specific peaks that we can find in, in, our, uh, in there. Uh, one more area that I want to point out to you, and that's this area right here. It seems to give students fits. Uh, this area right here. Notice he says this is a carbon hydrogen stretch, huh? This is where you have carbons and hydrogens together. Hey, since we're analyzing hydrocarbons, guess what? This is going to be in every one of them. And I'll tell you, he has a couple of little uh, pointy things here. Many times it's lots of pointy things. It's going to have like lots of gooey stuff going on in here because we have a lot of carbons and hydrogens, right? And so their environments are slightly different, so they're going to vibrate slightly different. And uh, so this is an area. So I tell students to watch out for stuff that's usually on this side of it and try not to interpret things somewhere between 3,000 and, and 2,800 or so. Uh, but if you see something on the other side of 3,000, then you might want to be perking up and paying attention to it and saying, hey, this could be a hydroxyl group or it could be an amine group that's sitting out here uh, greater than 3,000. Okay, I think that solves that for me. Um, so I brought this one back up because I want to uh, draw an attention to this. This here is an ethanoic acid. Okay, let me draw the structure of ethanoic acid here. So uh, it should be one that I think we are familiar with. So ethanoic acid, we've got ourselves a carbon with three hydrogens, another carbon, a carbonyl group, and a hydroxyl group on the end of that, right? So this is ethanoic acid, and here is the spectra for ethanoic acid up here, right? So you can see in this spectra, there's that long sword, isn't it, right? Around uh, 1700 or so. And uh, that is representing a carbonyl group, which is present right here, isn't it? There it is. And then over here, you can see, now again, break this up a little bit. This stuff that's over here, these are the carbon hydrogens. Mm -hmm. But what I'm looking at is on this side of 3000, I'm seeing this big fat area like this, huh? And that's the tongue of the uh, hydroxyl stuff. So I'm kind of looking at this 3000 point and I'm looking at what's over here and I'm sort of ignoring that. And then I'm looking at what's over here and I'm saying, hey, if I got big fat things over here, it's probably a hydroxyl group or an amine group of some type. So yeah, that is our hydroxyl group that's sitting there. Okay. Um, so that's just a way that we sort of quickly, a way that we sort of interpret uh, these graphs. Um, let's take a look at a couple of graphs and see uh, how they look in different things, different uh, features in the graphs that we can see. So this is a hexanol. And I note from the name that it's an alcohol, right? 
So again, uh, there's that 3000 line. Here's stuff here. But remember, this is that carbon-hydrogen stuff that's going on, isn't it? I'm going to kind of ignore that. Now, someone who's highly trained can make sense out of this kind of stuff. They can look for different types of bonding patterns, but uh, it's going to be outside of the scope that we want. Right here, though, is our big tongue wagging down at us. I'm saying this is the OH group, huh? Notice nothing here at uh, 1700, so it's missing. That is not the peak right here. This is not the peak at 1700. It'll come down much further, okay? Uh, here's hexanal. Hexanal. Uh, if you're up on your naming, you know that hexanal is a, uh, an aldehyde, isn't it? And so the aldehyde is going to have, you know, is going to have five carbons there and then the sixth carbon is going to be like this right and so uh, I have a carbonyl group in a hexanal and you can see there's our carbonyl group right there isn't it mm -hmm. but what's missing is what's on this side of the 3000 line notice there's nothing over here this is not a tongue hanging down again these tongues are going to be th these absorptions are going to be much bigger than just little tiny things up here on the top okay so and again all of this stuff over here is in what was what's known as the fingerprint zone and uh, these things are very complicated. Again, trained people can make sense out of it. Uh, computers can match it up to other samples and say, hey, these two are exactly the same, kind of like, you know, a fingerprint, yes? And they can say, all right, these two are exactly the same, so this is the type of substance it is. So, uh, but for us, we're just not trained enough to be able to do things like that. Okay. So there's comparing some. Let's compare some more here. Oh, I told you I was going to talk to you a tad bit about amines here because they're sort of interesting, I think. First of all, amines take place way high in the, in the uh, wave numbers, right? So they're up 33, 35, 36. You know, they're way up there, even beyond uh, the OH groups. And so when you're looking at these, um, notice that these are going to be way up there. They do kind of form sort of a tongue-ish thing, if you will. This one sort of has a bit of a tongue here, but it's not an OH group. And uh, this author of the, of the webpage said that uh, he looks for uh, either one tooth or two tooths, two teeths. And it has to do with whether it's a primary amine or a secondary amine. You know, a primary amine is going to have two hydrogens that are attached to it, so that nitrogen is only going to be attached to one other carbon. But a secondary amine is going to have only one hydrogen that is attached to it because that nitrogen is going to be attached to two other carbons, right? And that's why we call it a, a, a secondary amine. Well, this stretch that we see that's going on, or this uh, absorption that we see is going on, is because of the hydrogen, right? The nitrogen-hydrogen bond that's wiggling around and vibrating and absorbing up the frequency. So you can see here, and I learned this from him, that if it's a primary amine, it's got two hydrogens on there, you get this sort of a double bump, right? It's like a fang, if you will, so primary amines can create this little double bump down here like a pair of fangs. Let's see the other one. Here's a primary amine over here, and you see two bumps on it, right? See, like two teeth coming down like that. And then for secondary amines, there's only one nitrogen-hydrogen bond, so you tend to get just one bump out of it. And uh, notice over here, another secondary amine, just one. See, instead of the twos like this. And they double like that. Okay. So anyways, I just thought I'd point that out about it means. I thought that was really interesting and, and a cool point that he had brought out. And uh, it's helped me when I look at things and try to interpret it as well. And it gives me some insight. You know, uh, part of what we study in IB is how do we know what we know? 
And uh, how do you know if this thing is a secondary amine or a primary amine? How do we even know secondary and primary amines even exist? Well, here is some uh, evidence, right? Some indirect evidence that there are different types of amines out there. And uh, we can see that in their infrared spectrums like this. Yeah, in science and in education and, and uh, in teaching ourselves and even in looking over media that comes our way, we need to be skeptical and we need to ask questions like that. How do we know that for real? How do we know for sure this is, this is giving us correct information? And uh, so, um, you know, in science, we don't just take things straight up and someone just says, hey, there's different types of amines. Well, prove it, right? Prove it. And so this is one way, uh, you know, that's just one small example of how science has had to go and has, has, has to show the differences in things. And these things take a long time. These, these uh, processes of understanding take a long time to understand what's really going on. And uh, it's not an instant age. Science is not one of these instant ages where you just get answers. Uh, people spend their whole lives, years, decades, working on one specific kind of a problem and from all different perspectives, right? So, um, you know, if you're headed into science, be comfortable with that type of life, uh, a skeptical life. All right, so here is the dude's website. So giving him full credit now. I probably should have done this right in the very beginning, but the Master Organic Chemistry website, I think they did a masterful job of, uh, especially for this, and it has other things on there as well. It has practice problems. And so I've stolen four of his practice problems for us to be able to work with here. Uh, so uh, he's given us a formula. So I want you to watch my pattern of how I go about solving this problem. First of all, he's given me a formula for this. And we've talked about how this particular these formulas we can get through chemistry, right? We can do combustion analysis. We, there's a whole myriad of different ways that we can come up with the ratio of the atoms in something. And so um, here we're starting out with that. We've got the ratio of the atoms, and he says that it's a molecular formula, so I'm not worried about it being an empirical formula here at this point, right? So uh, let's consider the uh, index of hydrogen deficiency with this, shall we? So I've got two times my five carbons here, plus two, and uh, I don't have any, um, oh, and then minus 10 for the hydrogens, right? I don't have any chlorines and I don't have any nitrogens. That's a zero there. And so when I put all of this together, I've got 10, 12 minus 10. So that's two divided by two is equal to one. Now you're like, Mr. Hicks, you're working with a, uh, an infrared spectrum, why did you do the index of hydrogen deficiency? I'll tell you why. This is giving me a clue. Not any one of these procedures is a definitive answer for what does the molecule look like. You have to piece together all of the clues before you're able to actually discern uh, what the molecule is looking like. So one clue that I want to go to is how much uh, saturation is there with this? And are there any unsaturated points? Now I can see that there is one degree of unsaturation. That means there's either a pi bond or a ring. So that's gonna eliminate this, right? D's out because it has no unsaturation in D. So um, if I were sitting down trying to guess, what is this C5H10O? and I were drawing out all of the different possibilities that this molecule could possibly be, D would be one that's out. I can throw that out just based on the index of hydrogen deficiency. All right, what else can we look for? Well, notably, I am looking over here around the 1700 range, and guess what I see is missing over here? I do not see a carbonyl group sitting here, do you? No carbonyl group. 
So if there's no carbonyl group, then that's going to eliminate this one, and that's going to eliminate this one. So here's something I want to point out in the way that I am analyzing this. I am not only looking for things that are there. Sometimes students fixate too much on what is there, right? I'm also focusing on what is missing. Hmm? You follow me on that? I'm focusing on what is missing as well as what is sitting there. And so the carbonyl group was missing. That makes it so that I can cancel out a couple of my different uh, ways, uh, you know, a couple of different possibilities here. All right, let's look. I have two left to go. And I noticed that this one has an OH group and this one does not have an OH group. And I'm looking right here, going to look for an OH group, and I see it. There it is. There's an OH group, yes? So uh, there's that big fat tongue. It's on this side of the 3,000 mark, right? Uh, I'm going to ignore this. These are the carbons and hydrogens that are stretching right there. So I'm not going to look at this and say, oh, there's two tips there. It's a fang. And I'm, it's a no, it's not an amine group because it's not in the right place. The amine groups would be over here. I'm not going to look at this and say, oh, it must be an amine group because I'm not looking for an amine group. Why am I not looking for an amine group? There's no nitrogen in the formula, right? So, uh, again, don't go hunting and pecking and trying to find things in this spectrum that doesn't really exist. And that really is what students have trouble with is they try to interpret every peak instead of just looking for these three basic peaks that can give you the information you need to figure out what type of molecule you're staring at. Huh? All right, let's move along. Uh, next one here, it says which ones of these would be a good one. So again, I'm going to start in the same place. Let's do our index of hydrogen deficiency. I'm going to do it right in my head. So 6 times 2 is 12, plus 2 is 14, minus 12. So that leaves me with 2. So that's an index of hydrogen deficiency of just 1, right? So that means that there is a degree of saturation. How'd that help you? That eliminates B, doesn't it? Out you go, B. And uh, now I can look at some of these others here. Uh, next thing I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for that carbonyl group. And yep, there it is, right around 17, 1800. Here is that big, long sword of the carbonyl group sitting there. So since I now know that it has a carbonyl group, that's going to get rid of this one. That's going to get rid of this one. And now I'm left with these two that are left over. And uh, this one here, oh, I could have gotten rid of this one on the index of hydrogen deficiency because it has a ring and a pi bond, right? So C is out because it has an IHD of 2. So that narrows it down to just D, right? D is my answer here. Um, okay, and you see what's missing. Is this the OH group? No, that's not the OH group sitting there because the OH group is very broad and it's going to come way down here, isn't it? We're not going to look for every little tiny peak that is popping up around here. Again, these are the carbon-hydrogen groups. Don't misinterpret this for an amine or something like that. And this whole zone over here is that fingerprint zone. You can't make any sense out of that unless you are someone who is well-trained. All right. I'm going to let you do this one. Why don't you hit pause for just a moment and try to work this one out. And then uh, when you hit play again, I will talk it through. Okay, how'd that go? Were you able to eliminate it, uh, eliminate the ones that you needed to to get to the right answer? I hope so. Uh, so looking at this over here, I'm going to do my index of hydrogen deficiency. And I notice that uh, 6 times 2 is 12 plus 2 is 14 minus 14. 
This has a hydrogen deficiency index of zero, huh? That means there are no unsaturations in it. There are no pi bonds. There are no rings. So that eliminated some of it. Um, another thing that I noticed, since there is no pi bond, I'm not even going to look for the carbonyl group here because it's just not going to be there. You'll notice it's missing, right? And the other thing that's missing, and again, we want to look this side of the 3000, is I do not see any uh, tongue sitting here, do I? So that means there is no hydroxyl group. So that gets rid of this one, and that gets rid of this one, and it brings it to C. C is our answer. Did you get that? That's awesome. How about one more and we'll call it a day. Go ahead, hit pause, work that one out. Okay, so uh, here's one more shot at what we're doing. Um, let's take a look at this, uh, the index of hydrogen deficiency. I see Four times two is eight, plus two is 10, minus eight, two divided by one, that's one. So it has an index of hydrogen deficiency of one. So uh, anything in here that's not saturated? No, they're all got at least one degree of saturation. This one has two, doesn't it? So you're out. And uh, this has one sitting there. That's not a uh, carbonyl group. Okay, so we got rid of one. Uh, another thing that we can see here is right around the 17, 1800 mark, there's that long skinny sword of the carbonyl group. So I'm saying this is going to be carbon oxygen. So what does that eliminate? That makes E out, right? And then let's take a look at one more thing on this side of 3000, right? Uh, I'm looking and I'm seeing, oh, there's a big fat area over here, isn't there? And it's kind of blended in with the carbon hydrogen stretches from over on this side, right? So I'm saying, you know what? I think there is a uh, an OH group in this, huh? That's what I'm guessing. Thinking there's an OH group. Now uh, that would eliminate this one, I guess. And uh, now I'm looking at these two, right? And how do I know which one of these two it is? Um, I, see, we're still left with more that we could learn to try and figure out. How do I know the difference between this one or that one? Both of them have OHs. Both of them have carbonyls. Uh, do they both have the same formula? One, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four carbons. Yeah. So um, I guess I don't know the difference between those two right there. It could be one or the other. And I'm sure it's kind of locked up in understanding what this sort of looks like. I'm guessing it's B, but um, that would be locked up in what this pattern here sort of looks like to uh, the, the trained eye. huh? Okay, so that helps us to understand, too, that... Even though we used two pieces of information with this, it still did not give us the perfect picture of what this molecule looks like. Huh? And so that's where we would go to even more things out there to help us, right? Mass spec could help us with uh, answering some of the clues for this. Uh, maybe we could use... Uh, some of the information from the uh, NMR, right, from hydrogen NMRs. Uh, they also have another one that's not, that I didn't cover, is called carbon NMRs, right? So they use uh, carbon, they can take a look at the environments of different carbons. So again, they use many different clues to come up with exactly what it is. And uh, no one set is the perfect one to take a look at to give you everything. So I hope you had fun analyzing some of these uh, hydrocarbons. Um, you know, again, I've done a set on four different types of analyses. And if you were confused about anything that we talked about in there and want to go back and maybe look at some of the other ones, 
uh, that's a possibility uh, as well. They're there for you. So uh, anyways, have fun with your chemistry, and we'll see you next time.